want to introduce everybody here on the panel. We have a, a wide range of specialties and we're going to have a discussion amongst ourselves with you all sort of listening into different topics and then we're going to open it up to general discussion and questions and hopefully that leads into some more discussions. The three of us or the four of us, I should say, each come from different backgrounds. So we had a, a sign up here, and I want to introduce everybody and just give a little bit of their background. Farthest to the right is John Mellon, who recently, how long ago, John, did you come here to, to practice? Eight, nine months ago. Eight, nine months ago, okay. So newly minted in practice and made his father very happy by joining him in practice. So, you know, some of us can dream. Anyway, he's, uh, he's trained at uh, SUNY Downstate in New York, did internal medicine at California Irvine, and then his gastroenterology here at Good Sam in the VA. Uh, he focuses in on specialized procedures, something called ERCP. We'll talk about that perhaps as a specialized test that he's particularly adept at and trained in. And his focus is on colon cancer prevention, one of his interests at least. And he works with his father, uh, Leon Rigberg, Stuart Treister, Gavin Leventhal, and, well, I mentioned his father, Jay. That's John Mellon. Welcome, John. All right. Next to him, we have a cardiologist, Nick Iyengar. Nick works with uh, Scottsdale Heart Group and his primary focus is on non-invasive cardiology, which means he does imaging work. Born in Birmingham, raised in New Orleans. Um, he was trained at Tulane, uh, Louisiana State, and then was at Brown University, and then on to Harvard for MRI imaging. Now here in Phoenix for, and then University of Iowa. Have to mention that, that was one I was connected with. When, when was that, Nick, that you came here? Four years ago. Four years ago. All right, Nick, <laughs> welcome and thanks for joining. And then Dr. Ron Korn, who is a radiologist, so we have uh, definitely a different perspective. Uh, Ron does nuclear radiology, that's his primary focus. He's chairman and director of research at uh, SMILE, and I imagine everybody here has been to SMILE, or just about, to be honest with you, so you, Ron may have looked at some of your images, who knows. Trained at Stanford, and then at UPenn, and Albert Einstein. He's been here a number of years. Ron's been with the group a long time. How long, Ron? Uh, not that long, Ron. Yeah, not okay. that long. <laughs> 16 years. 16 years. All right, very good. Well, all right. All right. So this is going to be somewhat informal, but I, I want to start by just having a conversation with everybody up here on the front. The first question or topic that I thought we might discuss, and it's a bit of a um, backhanded topic, but I think it's worthwhile discussing because it's been in the news of late, is a question of appropriate testing and what I would call unnecessary testing. And so I'm going to talk with John. You know, right now, I don't know if you were, or saw it in the, in the news, but there's been a lot of talk about too many uh, tests being done, certain things that are excessive, and, you know, primarily looking at the cost structure of, you know, insurance costs, Medicare costs, these kinds of things. And people say, you know, what's the right interval of testing? So for your colon cancer screening, for instance, is one of your areas of expertise. So maybe you can speak to the idea of proper testing, excess testing, and then that, that connection, in my mind, that happens between us and the patient when they want to uh, maybe uh, have a test and we're not so sure they should have it. Sure, well it's been shown a number of times through survey studies and actually various different kinds of studies that the frequency with which colonoscopy is utilized is actually too frequent and oftentimes physicians, and it really comes from the physician's end, actually perform colonoscopy more frequently than the guidelines. So if you have a normal colonoscopy the uh, guidelines recommend you have another one in 10 years if you know, all other health-related issues considered. If you have a polyp removed that's precancerous, typically anywhere between three and five years is the interval where the exam should be repeated. And that depends largely on the size of the polyp as well as the histology when we put it underneath the microscope. If it has certain features that we call villus features or high-grade dysplasia, then patients should come back in a three-year period. But in terms of overutilization in the GI community, the biggest problem is that we frequently bring patients back sooner than the interval that's suggested. So from an efficiency standpoint and a cost management standpoint, it's, it's, it's a bit of a problem. Now, the reasons why that's done is actually fairly practical. So, so again, from a practical perspective, if the colonoscopy prep is uh, suboptimal, and something could have potentially been missed, then it's, it's very reasonable to bring the patient back. Oftentimes, depends really on the clinician's experience during the exam and, and really how much of a quality exam it was. But as an overall premise, and, and this is true, well, as, as an overall premise, colonoscopy is, is utilized probably a little too much, which has, again, has a lot of 
cost uh, waste implications. And, and why does that, I'm just curious why that happens. I can imagine that there might be, you know, some of the practical things that happen in offices are that, you know, like you might have a, a system that like, you know, is a reminder system. Or, you know, or you might have patients who call up and say, you know, I'd like to do it a little bit earlier because of some concern in their, you know, maybe a symptom concern or maybe just, you know, honestly, the things that kind of motivate all of us are, you know, my friend just had colon cancer. I'm now more worried than I was before and I want an earlier check. Yeah, and that's, that's very common. I mean, we just had colorectal cancer prevention month, so, you know, you probably all heard a lot about um, colon cancer stories and how to prevent colon cancer and the importance of colonoscopy, and obviously I'm a huge advocate of that, and we can probably talk about colon cancer prevention later, but we do get a lot of stories of people who are fairly anxious about having the exam done, and also the other issue is oftentimes patients, you know, 40, 5, 46, 47, 48 years of age want it done before they're 50 years old. And a lot of times you can sort of relate to their story and, and want to do the exam earlier. But then again, the guidelines say that 50 years of age is when screening should start. And that's, you know, largely because the odds of finding an advanced polyp or cancer prior to 50 years of age is fairly minimal. So, you know, the guidelines are based on a lot of scientific data and studies. So a lot of times, you know, we really have to steadfast to those recommendations, but patients will want it done prior to 50 years of age. You know, I think another thing that patients may not realize is that when, you know, when your last patient had a bad outcome or trouble from a disease, you tend to be a little more prone to say, well, I am more concerned about my, my patients for the moment because I saw this unusual case of a young person, let's say, who had a colon cancer. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't want to miss these for my patients. So therefore, I'm going to maybe yeah, maybe you should do it a little early, that kind of thing. Does that influence you? Do you think that's part of what goes yeah, on? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it, it absolutely does. You know, the other things to consider are family history, which is really important. A lot of times what will happen is we'll get a, a very um, vague family history uh, story from the patient. The things to consider are if you have a first-degree relative who developed colorectal cancer prior to 60 years of age, then the guidelines suggest that perform the exam as early as 40 years old. So a lot of times I'll hear a story that, well, you know, I might have had a family member who has colon cancer or maybe it was stomach cancer, et cetera. And in those kind of situations, you know, uh, I find myself tending to screen a little bit earlier uh, without a lot of documented uh, history, but I still end up doing it. So a lot of times, you know, the patient's sort of anxiety about getting it done a little earlier does, it, in fact, influence my decision. But again, I try to really stick to the guidelines and sort of stay with those because that's really where the data is. Okay, so data focus. Ron, can you talk about this? Because, I mean, you guys are dealing with x-rays, radiation. I mean, people, and same thing with the colonoscopy. I mean, there's the downside of the test. I mean, you know, a person has a test done and, you know, a complication arises, you know, minor or more significant. And we have to consider these things also in some balanced equation. I, I don't know what the mathematics are. I mean, people work out the mathematical equations. But in our practice, we tend to have to think separate from statistics. What, what do you think about that from a x-ray? To answer your question, very simply, yes, we overtest. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there are good reasons for it sometimes, and sometimes there are not such good reasons, and sometimes we just don't know why we test or overtest. The American public is very uh, enamored with technology. And what better technology is there than using a magnet 10,000, 100,000 times stronger than the magnet on the refrigerator to look inside your body in a painless way and figure out what's going on? That's just Star Wars type technology, and that's fantastic. And if we can look inside and figure out what's going on, why shouldn't we figure out what's going on when you have a problem? And it's a, it's a question that is answered, well, every time you look, you're going to find something. And everything you find isn't going to be so bad. And every time you think it could be bad, it may turn out to be normal, and you may have to undergo a lot of tests to show, up, show you're OK. And you may end up getting hurt in the case, in a situation, or die. So just looking, because you can and because we love technology, isn't the right approach. What Dr. Mellon was referring to is the exact way that we should be testing and how we can, pro, how we can eliminate a lot of over-testing, which is we need data, we need science, we need guidelines to tell us when we should and when we shouldn't test. If I hurt my back this week, do I need an MRI? Well, the answer is no. 
because depending on the injury or the pain, that's going to go away on its own. So what does the MRI tell you? It just tells you that there's something wrong. And just because we see something wrong doesn't mean it's causing the problem. You have to balance what you want to do with imaging and what you're going to do with that information. If you're going to do nothing with the information and treat somebody the way you would normally treat them without the information, never, don't get the test. It's the wrong thing to do. What drives a decision to make tests really starts back in the early 1900s with Rentgen, who discovered the x-ray. And it's the way physicians think. When you come into Dr. Lakin's or Iyengar's or Mellon's office, the first thing you do is you tell them what's wrong. That's called your chief complaint. And then a bunch of questions will be asked of you. And through that question and answer period, it's not random. They're, they have in their mind what causes your symptoms, what questions will help narrow down the cause of your symptoms. And then the important question has to be asked, well, what test do I need to prove that you have what I think you have or prove that you don't have what I think you have? And what kind of testing will I do? I'll do laboratory testing, I'll do radiology. And once you get into the radiology cycle, this is where the fun begins because there, there's an old Irish saying that says you can't find everything in one thing. So if you get a CT, I promise you, you might get an MRI. And if you get an MRI, you're going to get a bone scan. And if you're going to get a bone scan, you're going to get an ultrasound. Because not one single study answers the entire question. It's like your silverware at the table. Yeah, yeah you, can, you can eat with a fork, and you can eat with a spoon, or you can eat with a knife. But if you had all three utensils, you can really eat a nice meal. And that's how radiologists think, and we're always ordering more tests. We don't know, what we're there to do is to tell you what we see, and then what the physician has to do at the end of the day is take the information we give them and put it together. Now, testing comes in many forms. If you come into the ER, the first thing the doctor in the ER is going to say is, what do I have to do to make sure you don't die? If you have a headache, I'm going to make sure you don't have any blood in your head, because that's the thing I'm worried about most. Okay, I don't have any blood in my head. Okay, so you just had a test. Was it necessary or not? Maybe. Or you may, be in a, you may have a physician, not suggesting anybody here, who owns their own equipment. And that may drive some decision making. Or you may come in demanding the test. Or I'll give you a perfect example, 26-year-old guy that I know thought he had Parkinson's disease. Very rare unless you're on certain drugs. But he, and he, he was so convinced he had Parkinson's disease that we did a CT scan, everything was normal. We did an MRI, everything was normal. And he just wouldn't stop. And, and the parents were ready to kill him, and he was ready to kill the parents because nobody would believe him. So there's a test that costs $32,000. And, and I was one of the few people who knew how to run the test. So the mom came to me and said, look, it, I, I'd pay $100,000 because we pr made a deal. If the test was normal, he was going to stop this nonsense and go into psych psychiatric testing. Okay. So, so we did the test, and it was normal. And the kid finally got the right treatment. So we treated some person's demand. So was that over-testing? Absolutely. Is that part of any guideline? No. But we treated the patient with the test. And so there's all kinds of reasons for over-testing. And we hope as time goes on, we'll utilize testing much better. Very good. Uh, Nick, from your perspective, as a, from a cardiology perspective, um, you know, I think that's, you know, obviously there are always health concerns. I think cancer is, you know, a very high one on everybody's list for a variety of reasons, but heart disease is also another one. That's, a, that's one where people you know, come in, their symptoms may be a little more vague, and they need to know in their own mind confidently, oh, my heart is okay. How does that fit into that whole scheme of testing appropriately and over-testing, and how do you sort so of think of it? The trouble with guideline-based medicine is it always falls down to the anecdote, okay? So you can do science-oriented medicine. And when you do that, you end up treating everybody at about the 90th to 95th percentile. That means by definition you are dragging some people down from the 100th percentile or 99th percentile down to the 95th percentile. And so if you do guideline-based medicine and do the things, the classic example is the breast cancer screening between 40 and 50 years old. Watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's going to get interesting. <laughs> you know, the, the, the answer is, is that, you know, there are certain people who are going to be missed. And the problem with chest pain in the ER, okay, so number one admission diagnosis in the United States, chest pain. Number one discharge diagnosis, chest pain, not cardiac. Number one cause of lawsuits is chest pain cardiac sent home. 
okay? And so you can't miss, and that becomes the problem, is that the anecdote always wins. If you have a 38-year-old woman who comes in with chest pain, the likelihood that she is having a heart attack is infinitesimally small if you take, if you take the number of 38-year-old women who come in with chest pain. That doesn't mean that I haven't had a 38-year-old woman who had a tear in the different layers of her coronary and actually had a heart attack. And so it becomes very difficult to separate, is this over-testing or is this not? Now, is there over-testing? There is absolutely over-testing. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows people who have been through tests that don't have to be. I have my, you know, not my father-in-law, but somebody's father-in-law, <laughs> has, has chronic stable angina. Okay, so what that means is he walks a certain distance and he's fine. He walks, you know, a certain distance a little bit faster and he gets a little pain in his chest. He's got a moderately blocked artery that causes this. They fixed it twice. It's stable. It's not going, it's not getting worse. It's always about the same. But for three years, he trooped every six months to his cardiologist to get a stress test to prove it was exactly the same over and over and over again. Why were we doing that? Did it make my, or not my father, <laughs> feel better that, that they did that? That it wasn't getting any worse? Maybe. Did his cardiologist make money off the test? Maybe. Did it keep him out of the emergency room? Maybe. The answer is, is that the reason there is, there is such an over push or there's a push for over testing and the problems that are created now is because medicine has been spectacularly successful at what it's done, okay? The tests have gotten better and better and better and better and we're looking at this going, you know, do you do the, I mean, if you can afford the BMW, do you get the Yugo? I mean, do you really do it? Are you losing something by not getting the BMW? And in order to figure out whether these tests had meaning, we had to first figure out what these tests meant. And, you know, it's only in the last probably 10 years that utilization and, you know, and what these tests mean has really become a forefront and a studied issue. It probably, you know, if you go back to when I was in training, we weren't sure that these tests were necessarily frivolous or, you know, or <coughs> overused or anything like that. I'm not saying that some of us didn't know that people were over testing, but that being said, we didn't know the value of these tests. And now the values of these tests are starting to come out and guidelines are starting to reflect it. And people are living longer. And the things that didn't matter to 60 year olds, okay, turn out maybe to matter to 80 year olds, okay? And we just didn't have generations of 80 year olds to study 20, 30 years ago. This is a new class of people that we just didn't know existed or didn't really exist in large enough numbers to study on a, you know, on a, on a level. And now you're saying to, make, to see whether or not that was, it's a, it's, and I don't, don't be offended by anybody who's 80 or over no, no, no. by this comment. But I mean, you know, look, we're talk, we'll talk about touchy subjects, but the question is, I mean, are you saying that we didn't um, know whether, in other, in other words, whether these tests were worthwhile to be done in an 80-year-old, that they were valid? or they were capable of making a diagnosis adequately or? Yes, and even the reverse is that, you know, in the, six, in the 30s, it didn't matter whether you smoked. It actually was completely irrelevant because you were probably gonna die in your 50s and 60s regardless of whether you smoked or not. It just changed what you died of, okay? It changed the dynamics of what you died of. And so as we push survival into the 60s and into the 70s and into the 80s and into the 90s, it turns out smoking becomes a colossal life limiter. And that is a totally different, if you brought somebody from the 40, you know, from, the, from medicine in the 1880s to medicine in 2012, they would be flabbergasted at what we could do. I mean, they wouldn't even understand the basics of what we did. Now, this is gonna get to one of your subjects. But why was heroin invented? Does anybody know why heroin was invented? Yes, but what, what particular thing drove it? It was invented as a safer alternative to aspirin. <laughs> because people were taking aspirin at the turn of the century in 1900 and bleeding to death. 
because there was no therapy for bleeding back then. Well, that, well, that brings us actually. I'm glad, that's a great segue. Thank you. <laughs> because actually, I you know, had that question, no, it's Harry. a perfect, it's a perfect segue. Because actually, that's the next topic I want to talk about. Actually, is aspirin. <laughs> Seriously, I did. And aspirin is a little over 100 years old. And yes, it was invented in the same time frame as heroin, interestingly. But aspirin is a place where I think we can all end up having some commentary because we have uh, sort of the, the big two that are going to be dealing with aspirin. And, and I think John can explain to you why aspirin is one of the big things in his life for a variety of reasons. And of course, you know, everybody knows heart and stroke and so forth for Nick. But John, why don't you talk about aspirin? And you know, I think everybody out here generally thinks everybody should be taking an aspirin every day. Probably not true. The key is that all of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, ibuprofen, Motrin, Naproxen, Advil, and aspirin, can all cause pretty serious peptic ulcerations, primarily in the stomach and the small bowel. Now, when they become severe, the ulcerations can potentially cause perforations and obstruction and really bad gastrointestinal bleeding. And so, a lot of times in the inpatient hospital setting, we see a lot of patients who have either a lot of pain or a lot of bleeding from these ulcerations. And it can actually happen from a small dose of aspirin, as small as 81 milligrams or maybe even less. And I'm sure a lot of you uh, are on that. So the key is, from, from our perspective in our literature, and we'll see what cardiology ha has to say, but you know, for secondary prevention, so if you've already had a um, coronary event, heart attack, et cetera, then we're all pretty probably going to be in agreement that taking an aspirin, depending on the scenario, is probably has enough benefit to warrant taking it. But I think a little more of a dicey topic is what we call primary prevention. And I guess in the simplest terms, if you haven't had a heart attack or an event or angina, then the question is whether you're going to be recommended to take the aspirin. The question is how much of a risk is it if you're taking the aspirin? And Again, drawing back on what our guidelines say, certain patients need to be protected when they're taking all the anti-inflammatory medications, including even a small dose of aspirin. So we've kind of began to target which patients need to be protected. And when I say protected, also taking other medications that prevent ulcerations, the proton pump inhibitor medications, which you know, in my practice, 40 to 50 and maybe even more uh, percent of patients are on one of these medications, Prilosec, Nexium, Prevacid, et cetera. What we found is there's a lot of patients who are going to be at risk for ulcerations when they take these medications, these uh, inflammatory medications, patients who are on Coumadin or other blood thinners, patients who are on steroids, patients who are on multiple anti-inflammatory medications, and patients who are on high dose of these uh, anti-inflammatory medications. So for us, I mean, we see it over and over again, bad ulcerations from all those inflammatory medications. And I think we need to do a better job of targeting which patients need to be protected with proton pump inhibitor medication. And again, it turns out that, you know, even if I prescribe a medication like that to a patient, a lot of times they don't have any symptoms or any pain or any heartburn, so they stop taking it, and that's when we can really get into a lot of trouble. And on our end, we don't prescribe them enough of the proton pump inhibitors to protect patients either. So there's a big problem, and a lot of patients who are at risk for ulcerations are taking these medications. So from my perspective, it can be very problematic. That being said, I mean, you know, these are obviously medications that you need to be on. I mean, aspirin's going to be vital for a lot of patients to be taking, so we just need to be careful. Now, can you come, John, can you comment about the colon cancer prevention potential of aspirin, which if the data, and I'll tell you from a general internal medicine perspective, is you know, if you look at aspirin as a preventive, it's sort of a 50-50 situation where if you look at it as a preventive, it's, it's beneficial for preventing uh, clotting strokes and heart attacks, but it also has the potential to cause bleeding. And if you look at that data, a lot of the data sort of nets out at a zero, meaning it prevents heart attacks and strokes, causes excessive bleeding, the, the game is zeroed out. But if you add in the colon cancer prevention of aspirin, you get a benefit. So take aspirin. That's sort of the argument. Can you comment to that from your end? Yeah. And then maybe we can have Nick comment from the cardiology. From end. my end, in terms of colon cancer prevention... Um, Do you use it? Do I don't. Words? I don't. Do and I, I think that gastroenterologists in general aren't, are kind of underwhelmed by that data. And a lot of it comes from patients who have polyp uh, syndromes. And so this might sound familiar. The cancer develops from a polyp. So a little growth on the lining of your colon wall that can get bigger and become a cancer. 
So in patients who have polyp syndromes, patients who have a genetic um, predisposition to having a ton of polyps in their colon, there's a lot of data that aspirin and anti-inflammatory medications can prevent the onset of polyps and prevent their progression. And there is some value for aspirin in those scenarios, but for an average risk person, and even a high risk person with a patient with family history of colorectal cancer, the data for aspirin and other uh, COX-2 inhibiting non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications is pretty weak and so we don't do so it. So you think it's meager and not, not a legitimate argument in favor of aspirin, so people don't. ask me that all the time. Should I be taking aspirin? Actually, probably most people are taking aspirin, I'm guessing, to be honest with you. That's what, that's the word on the street. So Nick, comment from a cardiology side, aspirin, yay, nay. Are you taking aspirin? Let's find that out first. <laughs> Too young. Um, <laughs> are you so taking heroin? <laughs> not telling my camera, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when doctors look at things, they look at morbidity and mortality, okay? And what are those are fancy words, right? Morbidity is how well you live and whether things happen to you. And mortality is do you live or die, okay, and when you do. I'm a heart doctor. My wife's an oncologist. Between the two of us, we take <laughs> care of the top three causes of death in the United States. Yeah. Heart attack, cancer, stroke. You've cornered the market. I said, if we can't live in North Scottsdale, nobody can. <laughs> this is the crux of the battle. And John and his brethren, gastroenterology has become incredibly good in the last 20 years. I mean, the growth in GI has been spectacular. And most of, you know, most of cancer reduction is in breast and colon and maybe lung, I mean, you know, maybe lung if you look at it. But, uh, you know, colon cancer screening has done spectacular things to colon cancer in this country. And they've become a victim of their own success, okay? And what has happened is, is that I don't care about bleeding. You know, I, as, a, as a heart doctor, I, I become, you know, I become almost immune to it. Here's clot, here's bleed. Okay, it's a spectrum of the disease, you know, it's a spectrum. The less likely you are to clot, the more likely you are to bleed. And there are no magic drugs that push you in both directions at the same time. They only push you in one direction. Drugs are dumb, okay? They're just like antihypertensive pills. They only push your blood pressure down. They don't push you to some magic number. They just keep pushing. I would venture to say, in the last 10 years, the mortality from GI bleeding in this country has probably dropped significantly. Dramatically, yeah. Is that due to PPI, the PPI medicines, the Prilosex and so forth? I, I believe it is. I don't see it anymore. In my practice, I used to see people, I don't see it happen. Rare, it happens, but not a lot. To that point, I mean, uh, previously, surgical intervention was fairly common for very nasty ulcerations that bled and bled and bled. And now, um, being a new physician since I've started, I've literally never seen a patient who needed to go to surgery for a bleeding ulceration and that's all because of PPIs. And that, that's a huge change from the 50s and 60s where it was perhaps the number one surgery in the country. Yeah. 90s in medical school, okay, I scrubbed on scrub surgery called vagotomies and trectomies. I don't know how many people had ulcer disease 100, you know, or 20 years ago. But, I mean, I did. You know, I didn't do them, but I sat in there and watched while other people did them. And, you know, but I, you know, 25, 30 surgeries for ulcer disease. And this was the beginning of PPI treatment in the United States. You know, and at that point, we only gave it to you for six months because everybody thought the risk of stomach cancer was higher related to taking PPIs for long periods of time. We didn't realize that at the time. And so I tell most people this. Is that the likelihood that you are going to bleed to death in the United States if you live near, I mean, I have a guy who, you know, works on oil rigs in Alaska. He doesn't get prophylactic aspirin because if something happens to him on an oil rig, it's going to be very difficult for him to get to someplace. But in the United States, if you are near a hospital, blood transfusions are spectacular inventions. Let me just argue a point just since we're going to get at it, and Ron can speak to this. I mean, because he, he made a point that I think is actually one of the number one things that happens in the ER, which is I hit my head. I saw that woman on TV, Richardson, she died of hitting her head. I got blood in my head now. So, this, so you're talking about bleeding in, you know, bleeding death. I agree. I don't think I've seen anybody bleed to death in this country. In, I don't remember one. But I don't know if they've ever seen it, really. But that said, you certainly see people bleed in their brain. 
and die. So this happens. Do. And this happens. anecdotally, so I don't want to sound. There, I want to no, no, no. The but I, 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 there, the it is aspirin. unlikely to. As I say, I mean, there are no absolutes in medicine. Anybody who t stands up here on stage or anywhere else and tells you absolutely yes or no, the answer is we're not that good. It's all inductive and deductive and logic. It's not perfect. Medicine is never perfect. It's always about probabilities. You know, what is the likelihood that this is related to this? So, Coumadin. So, I'm sure a number of people here are on Coumadin, right? Coumadin is the greatest drug ever invented, okay, in terms of lives saved. If you look at it, every mechanical valve in this country, every pulmonary embolism, every, you know, atrial fibrillation to prevent stroke is on Coumadin. In terms of pure numbers of lives saved, I think Coumadin tops aspirin, probably tops penicillin, probably tops amoxicillin, probably tops Lasix in terms of pure number of lives saved over time and in terms of what you call it. It's also a terrible drug. It is an incredible pain. If you look at people who are on blood thinners for atrial fibrillation and who have a tendency toward falling, okay, so people who are at risk for falling and banging their head, they actually do better in the long run being on Coumadin than not being on Coumadin. There are people who fall and bleed. There are people who fall and hit their head. But statistically, in evidence-based medicine, the likelihood that you're going to fall, bleed, hit your head, and have a hemodynamically significant bleed in your head turns out to be relatively low. Well, let, me, let me ask you another question and get Ron involved in this one. Because I think when we start talking about bleeding, you know, Ron gets to see a lot of the bleeds in another way. He gets to see them radiologically. Or, um, and I guess one of the questions I'd ask you, and I don't know if you can answer this or have a sense of it, um, in your practice, do you have any sense of what the most dangerous medicine is that you think is prescribed? I mean, is it Coumadin? When we're asked to rule out a bleed, either in the head or the body, most of the time the patient's on Coumadin. Is that right? Yeah. So, so it is a common problem. Uh, and we can detect it very readily in the brain with, with CAT scans. Elsewhere in the body, we don't do so well. And that's where we call in Dr. Mellon to look at a scope to see if he can figure out if it's coming from inside the intestine somewhere, and then if it's not, we get a CT scan. But Coumadin is our number one reason why we check for blood. All right, I, I, don't, wanna, I don't wanna cut any of these topics short, but I wanna sort of move on to maybe a few other but things. I, I do have one quick oh, yeah. question, yeah, because I hear a lot about people have different sensitivities to aspirin because of their genetic background, their, their makeup. Do you use that at all in clinical practice? Some people, when they take it, actually causes hypercoagulable or more clotting. Other people don't. I mean, I, I had done genetic testing at one point just to, to see if people were aspirin, aspirin resistant. I didn't find it have any practical use. I don't use it. I don't, know if, I don't know if you guys use it in any way to assess effectiveness or ineffectiveness. I think you want to talk about endless testing. There is data that says that you, if you give certain antihypertensive pills at certain times of the day, they do better. You know, and could you test all of these people for all of these things? But at some point, you have to take sort of blanket things. And I think that I think you're right. I think that there are certain people who have genetic predispositions toward clotting, and aspirin can exacerbate those. All right, I'm going to switch gears for just a second, go and ask everybody a question, then we're going to open up for some questions and then maybe bring it into the audience so we can then sort of share some ideas. I just, I just thought each of you could comment in sequence, John starting first, just a, a topic of sort of what you see coming in the, I don't want to say broadly in the future, but things that you think are of interest to you, that you think will be of interest to, the, to our patients here, about um, uh, something in G, the GI area that's going to be, have maybe a profound impact, or is of interest for some reason for whatever fascinates you. Could you just briefly talk to something on that topic? Yeah, and I'll stay with the same theme, um, which is colonoscopy. We're going to see tremendous gains in terms of the efficiency of colonoscopy and the technology that we're using. We've already seen a lot of it, and it's ground up from fairly simple stuff to fairly complicated. And it's fairly, it, it's, it's pretty easy to articulate what's going on. The first change is, is our monitors. Um, you know, when we do the exam, while, while we're doing the exam, we're looking at a monitor. We have incredible high-definition monitors now, which isn't just a nice perk. Um, it, it changes outcomes. So during the examination, w w again, um, we're looking for polyps. 
polyps that we can remove prior to them becoming cancer. And so with our new high, defin high definition monitors, we're able to detect way more polyps. You know, it makes sense intuitively that we would prevent more cancer with that kind of technology. Now, we also have technology that we're going to be getting here soon, I've heard, on the Shea campus, which is narrowband imaging. Not to get too technical, but it's, it's a technology where we can look at the colon as opposed to white light, we can look at it in, in blue wavelength light, and it turns out by looking in blue wavelength light, we can see the blood vessels in the colon much better. And it's yet another technique that helps us to determine which lesions in your colon are precancerous and can be removed. And that's important because when we perform a colonoscopy, typically uh, we remove all polyps we see, and some of them are not precancerous. So it really doesn't make a difference to the patient, but in terms of cost efficiency, to remove a polyp, use a, use a device to remove the polyp, put it under the microscope, have the pathologist look at it, there's a lot of extra costs. So we're getting to the point where during the exam we can see which of the lesions in your colon are precancerous and which are not. And in Japan they're taking that even farther by spraying a certain dye onto the colon during the exam to better um, identify which lesions are precancerous. So a bit of a change for us and, and certainly a change in the right direction to improve colonoscopy efficiency. And the, only, the other thing in colonoscopy that's upcoming that some of you might have already experienced is the split dose preparation. Uh, that's a big thing for us this year and, and what it is is as opposed to taking all of the bowel prep the day before, you take half of it the night before and half of it the morning of. Sounds pretty simple. Turns out that really, really, really improves the colonoscopy preparations. And again, staying with the same theme, that means I can see more and remove more polyps and um, get a little more assistance in terms of preventing colon cancer. So in my mind, that's the biggest thing in the past year or two would be the improvements in how we perform colonoscopy. And you know, we're, we're now seeing studies showing that these kind of approaches improve outcomes and detect more polyps and prevent more cancer. So that's been fairly exciting for us. Interesting. I, I didn't know any of that. Interesting. Ron, can you answer? Well, along the lines of cancer, I, I think that this is the most exciting area for radiology. And um, I think most of you in the audience are aware of or will be aware of how blessed we are with our oncology program here that Dr. Arger's wife has been a, a big part of. Uh, we have a phase one clinical trial program where we test new drugs for treatment of cancer. And all these drugs are, are what we call targeted or precise therapies. They hit certain pathways in our cells that have gone wrong and they help stop those pathways from uh, functioning anymore and thus treating cancer. And the last, the, the last, the newest drug to be approved by the FDA was a drug to treat basal cell cancer and that gets metastatic and that was approved in record time in five years and Dan Van Hoff was really the leader in, in bringing that trial. We were the first ones in the world to, to do that, uh, to try that drug for basal cell. And there are about 10 or 15 other drugs that have similar possibilities. And one of the questions that I'm always asked from the oncology point of view is, how can I help the oncologist decide whether drugs are working uh, faster? I should put it this way, how can I help them decide whether the drugs are working and give them the answer as quickly as possible? Because the last thing you want to do when you have cancer is to be on a drug one day longer than necessary. Time is your enemy, and so you want to know as quickly as possible. With the basal cell cancer drug, we were the first to do something called PET scans on this cancer, which is a nuclear medicine study looking at the metabolism or how much energy the cancer is using. And we found that within one or two doses of this, taking this drug, the cancers stopped taking up the radioactive material showing that they were dying right in front of our eyes, which was amazing. And so we've developed a program here that we're is just getting off the ground. It's called a radar program, which is for the which means the rapid assessment and detection of response, where where we believe using the right cancer, the right treatment, and the right imaging study within eight hours, we may be able to tell whether your tumor is responding to therapy or not. And that I think is just revolutionary. And some of the data we're getting from that actually goes even deeper, where we can look at an image in some cases and predict what the genetic expression is of that tumor off of a regular CT scan. 
So when I look out there at what's cool and what's exciting and what needs to be proven and tested, but what is, uh, could be available in the next three to five years, it's this use of imaging to really uh, dive very deep into not only looking at organs and tissues, but even the molecular biology of what's going on in the cell, and, and that's remarkable. Okay. Nick, what's, what's up from cardiology on your end? Something mundane, perhaps? <laughs> Unfortunately, I mean, if you look at Low survivals cost. in this country, <laughs> most of the survival improvement in this country has been cardiology-based. I mean, you know, the, the, you know the, the, the big jump has been coronary disease has become an entity that is very well treated. Unfortunately, everybody knows the name Tim Russert, right? Tim Russert had a stress test and then died three weeks later because there are plaques that we can't assess. We don't know how, everybody, if you look at 15 year olds who have who've been in car accidents, they already have plaque on their aortas, okay, at, at that age. And so everybody develops these plaques in their coronaries as they get older. Some of these become significant and rupture and cause heart attacks, and that's what causes heart attacks in a lot of young people. And it's unforeseen and it's chaotic. The search for the vulnerable plaque is probably the biggest sort of thing on the horizon in terms of cardiac treatment. Heart failure is sort of emerging as a big problem. And, and things to be done for heart failure are, are improving rapidly. Um, heart transplants are down 50% in this country in the last 12 years. Do you know why? It's because cars are so safe there are no donors. Okay, it's a weird problem to have, right? And so how do you, you just go out and kill more young people so that there are more hearts to transplant? I don't, I, that's not really a solution, is it? And so, um, so all of that money that was in heart failure, that was in transplant, is now being devoted into LVADs and devices to help your heart pump better. And that money is spectacularly succeeding. I mean, you know, the, the change in heart failure treatment in this country in the last eight years has been overwhelming and mechanical support. I mean, Dick Cheney is a testament to it. I mean, he lived with that device for a period of time, right? And so the two sort of changes on the horizon for cardiac disease are, one, people who have vulnerable, the identification of vulnerable plaque, i.e., people who are at risk for having heart attacks, which will help Dr. Mellon immensely because then we won't have to give all these people aspirin, right? The only people who will have to take aspirin are people who have vulnerable plaque or that need vulnerable plaque. Some of this goes into what Dr. Korn does. The CAT scanners that they're making are spinning so fast and getting such good pictures of coronaries that we don't know what to do with the information. The information load and the information that's being ascribed from these CAT scans of people's hearts, you've seen these pictures, they are spectacular. They are so good, we don't know what to do with them. And in the next six to eight years, data will be out about that. And it will change the way coronary disease is approached in this country. And all this costs money, I think. You figured that out, too. Well, look, um, I, I, I'm going to stop this portion of our, our program and then open it up to some questions. We're not going to be able to take everybody's question, obviously, but we'll take some questions, and we'll do this for about 15, 20 minutes. Well, so I, since we're making all these advances in medicine, so what are we going to do with all of us who are going to live to be 125? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Dr. Korn may be able to speak about this idea, but um, it turns out at 85 years old, 50% of the population has some form of dementia. And there are PET scanners that are coming out, there are PET scans. The data seems reasonable, but I, you know, this is his area of expertise, so I'll defer to him. But it turns out the main life limiter now turns out to be if you do all the things you're supposed to do, get colon cancer screenings, take aspirin, and so, you know, do the things you're supposed to do, you get to 85, and then, you know, it turns out to be a brain thing. And so maybe yeah, you what could you say about it? Yeah, tell us about Th There's a new agent that coming. just got proved. It's called Floridabar. And um, actually, we tested it here in this community. It's an agent that's radioactive.
that binds to the protein that causes Alzheimer's disease in your brain. And it is a remarkable agent in, in this respect. If you have problems with memory, or your doctor thinks your memory problems could be due to Alzheimer's disease, you get the test. If the radioactive material binds to your brain, it doesn't mean you have Alzheimer's disease. Because as you age, we get these normal, we get these proteins build up normally that are also part of Alzheimer's disease. But if you have no binding in your brain, you don't have Alzheimer's disease. You either stop worrying about Alzheimer's disease or you figure out what else it is. And, and the expected market for that is 100 million, uh, 1 billion over the next five years. And I think Nick is right on target. It's, it's going from the heart now to the brain as we get better with cancer and heart disease. I have a question about colonoscopies. Um, to, it's two part actually. Um, the level of risk with regard to perforations and who actually performs the colonoscopy? Is it you as the doctor or is it a tech? Nurses and nurse practitioners, I think, were doing flexible sigmoidoscopies maybe as recently as 10, 15 years ago, but now it, it's, it's certainly in the past decade, it's only gastroenterologists performing colonoscopies. In the big picture, colonoscopy is an exceptionally safe procedure. However, there are risks. There is a slight chance of bleeding, perforation, which is putting a little tear in the colon, or even infection. Last year at one of our national conferences, there was a large study. I want to say there was nearly 100,000 patients in the study uh, looking at just that, how frequently these things happen. Because we have old data, but we needed an <coughs> updated view in terms of how frequently these things were happening with our new technology, new technique, all that. So certainly it happens less than 1%. Turns out quoting a number maybe like 0.01% would probably be fairly accurate. So it's one in 10,000 you're saying? Yeah, roughly. One in yeah. 10,000. Yeah, and, and the older data maybe saw that a perforation happened a little bit more frequently than that, but not much more. I mean, it's certainly been, always been way under 1%, but I think 0.01% is, is fairly accurate. I mean, it happens that infrequently. It's not something we commonly see, but going into a colonoscopy, <laughs> you need to know that that's a risk. And that data was from patients who were average risk patients, not patients who um, are much, much, much older with a lot of inflammatory changes in the colon, diverticulitis, et cetera. Those are fairly healthy patients, but it gives you an idea of how avoidable uh, a complication is. Along those lines, can you comment about the uh, virtual colonoscopy? For those of you who don't know, and maybe uh, you're probably more comfortable commenting on the technology, but it's a highly advanced, uh, it's CT scan actually, technology um, that gets a virtual optical sort of mimics a 3D look inside the colon. The advantages being that um, it's less invasive and it's a super highly charged topic. From our perspective, if you find a polyp or something that might need to be removed, you have to undergo a regular colonoscopy anyways and there's a lot of other issues in terms of uh, funding, CMS uh, coverage for it, and going back to what we talked about before, incidental findings that we see on this CT colonography that we're doing essentially for colon cancer screening, we find all this other stuff. Now obviously I'm going to talk about the um, disadvantages, <laughs> but we'll have Ron talk about the advantages of that. Uh, just quickly, uh, John, you're on point on all of that. Virtual colonoscopy is a great technology. It performs as good as optical colonoscopy. You can't perform biopsy at the same time, so you have to go back two separate days. Its role is yet to be defined. We believe that the best role are for people who really can't get a colonoscopy. They can't be taken off their blood thinners, for example, or they're at high risk for getting anesthesia then the virtual colonoscopy really is as good. A couple of things you have to be aware of. You gotta make sure that the radiologist who reads it is specially trained because poop looks like polyp. And so you can confuse the two and, and you'll see a lot of stuff that really doesn't exist. Uh, the second thing is that the radiation dose is about as much as you would get spending a year in the sun. So there is some radiation. If you're over 60 or so, it's less of a concern, but as you get younger, it becomes more of a concern. And most insurances don't cover it. Um, one 
subject that was not touched on was uh, prostate. Uh, I know that there's a lot of issues regarding prostate cancer and uh, examinations. Uh, I happen to have gone through one of those, and I'll tell you, I've had a colonoscopy, but nothing like what you go through with getting a prostate exam. Well, I don't know. I don't know that any of us are actually capable of commenting on that more specifically, unfortunately, because nobody here is a urologist. Does anybody have anything they want to add on that? I'm like an OBGYN. I only know it's only <laughs> Yeah, everybody here is a little bit focused on their area. Well, it would be interesting to hear what Dr. Lakin does with the PSA testing, because that's an area of controversy. I think it's a great area of controversy. I still use it. I've been here, you know, I, I was there when they invented it, and I've seen it for 20 years. I was literally, practically there where they invented it. You know, I think there's a lot of controversy. I mean, this is a classic area, the whole prostate thing. You know, are we overdoing it? You know, and then you know the story of the case that was missed, or, you know, the anecdotal story. It's very complex. I mean, I think, and then the testing, which formerly, when we first did them, never had complications. Now we're seeing superbugs resistant germs. So now we're seeing cases where people have prostate biopsies and we're having complications. So actually what we're seeing is over my, the span of my career to date, we're seeing a disease transform in front of us. And, it, and it, the diseases as they transform with the new technologies, new treatments and complications often are uh, ahead of us a little bit. They're ahead of us and we don't know what the data suggests we should really be doing. Yeah, it's not a question, but just a comment. I wanted to uh, thank all of you for sharing your evening with us. And uh, we read about the data. I mean, this is in the paper. It's on the news. But we don't get the sense of humor, and that's uh, much appreciated. <laughs> thank you. Well, I, I think that's a good point. And, you know, I must say that, you know, we uh, – well, oh, the, what was the question? You know, uh, uh, Grady was just saying that the, the, we, we hear about the data, but this is a more human side, too really the complexities of these considerations. And I think, you know, getting a chance to actually sit down for a quiet hour and talk to these guys myself is a great uh, privilege and enjoyable because I get to hear really the complex thought processes that are going on. And, you know, when people say, well, do I really need to see that specialist? What, you know, they'll say to me, what do they know more than you? I mean, I think this, this really exemplifies what they know a lot more about their area of expertise. And, you know, uh, I, I just think it's very important to understand, not just, uh, you know, generally, what, uh, you know, specialists have to offer, particularly, but also what, you know, uh, the, I mean, the excellence that we have here in Scottsdale, which is really pretty tremendous. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Heimgar, uh, are CT scans now as good as a stress nuke test? They answer different questions to some degree, okay? So stress perfusion imaging is designed to des decide how functionally significant a lesion is. What that means is, is how much is it blocking flow down an artery and how is that muscle behaving related to that? Is there a functional lack of blood flow there? CT is an anatomic idea. And so anatomic means how badly blocked is this artery? CT is the equivalent of angiography, which we have always decided is the perfect test. It's the perfect test because we defined it to be the perfect test. And it suffers from, you know, when it, whenever you set anything as the gold standard, everything else suffers as a relation to that. So if you define, if you define nuke to be the perfect standard, then angiography would be, you know, you would decide how good angiography is related to that. Ron can answer this question too, because Ron's my direct competition. Um, and he, uh, I would say that CT is a bountiful source of information <laughs> that we're not sure all of what it means is. And there is a lot of radiation involved and there is a lot of things involved in CT that may or may not, may be its downfall or may not be its downfall. And so, but it is much better than it was five years ago. It is colossally better than it was 15 years ago. It wasn't even thought of 15 years ago. So the answer is, is that it's getting closer, but they answer different questions for us, I think. I would just add two things. One, it's the first time I agree with my competitor here. <laughs> and secondly, one use of the, of the CT scan uh, looking for coronary artery disease can be in the emergency room where somebody has chest pain. You get a CT angiogram, and if it's completely normal, the chances that the chest pain is due to 
coronary artery disease is very unlikely. So there's a certain security in knowing that. Very good. PLAC test, which uh, I read is a powerful predictor of the most common type of stroke. And the test is more specific for vascular disease than the commonly ordered test for C-reactive protein. Could you comment on this? If there is a chance that the usual CRP test will be replaced by this better test? Um, there's a new uh, blood test out called the PLAC test. I'm familiar with it, but not the details of it. I'm hoping Nick knows something about this, and he can comment, versus the CRP, which is a blood test that's done to look for inflammation levels and relate that to heart disease. So this plaque test that I've heard of. Does it, Nick, do you know anything? The answer is, uh, to speak confidently about this, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I can tell you the, the use of novel biomarkers is is a huge industry and it is a lot there are a lot of people who are trying to come up with the next new test to find what is an appreciable difference between cholesterol I mean cholesterol is Framingham data I mean this goes back to the 1950s and you know and we're not much better at it you know, in 60 years. It turns out that those tests were pretty good. The incremental benefits of all these tests are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so uh, there, are, there are lots of tests that are out there. And I, I don't know a ton about PLAC, except I, I've seen a couple of people who've come and asked me about it. And I apologize, I haven't actually read about it yet. But I will tell you that in general, I tend to be a skeptic. And everybody is trying to sell you something. And there are people who are making money off of these tests. I don't discount them. I don't say that you know, CRP doesn't have a role in certain things. The guy who invented or who did the study for CRP also owns the patent on the assay. And so he benefits both academically and financially with, with the advent of the, the what you call it. That does not impugn the, the study itself. I'm not saying that the study falls down, but it becomes harder to believe. And so the answer is, is that yes, those things are coming. No, nothing has been, the advantage of being me is that when something really changes in cardiology, it's international news. I mean, it's plastered <laughs> off of USA Today. And so the answer is, is that That's all of it. these tests are marginal, probably benefits. And I, I can't say that I have been s significantly impressed with particle assay testing, with lipoprotein A testing, with homocysteine testing. All of these things have come and gone in big waves. Myoglobin was this new molecule that we were going to test for, for heart attacks. You know, you saw a huge wave of it, and then it disappeared. Troponin testing, which is proteins from the heart when, came in, when you come in for a heart attack, very selective for the heart. That changed practice. And that's and now is this, I'm curious if it's the same in Europe. Does anybody have a sense whether it's the same in Europe that these tests sort of become fashionable, are used broadly, or somewhat, you know, somewhat used, used broadly, and then it, they sort of disappear? I agree. I, I'm a bit of a skeptic about all these tests, too, and don't generally recommend them. For select people, they have a value. But generally, I think there, there's a lot of money to be made in these tests. And we're trying not to squander the money. <laughs> I think all of us here, despite all our interest in our technology, try not, not to squander. We're not trying to squander society's money. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, if it matters to you and, it thinks, and you think it will change things, then, and, it, you th and you believe in something, then do it. You know, at, at some level, it's your money, it's your choices. I mean, you get to decide what you spend the money on. But society has to say, unless there is a proven benefit to these things, then I can't spend his money on your test. All right, now I'm going to leave this before we get too complex here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. You have a significant history of heart disease in your family. Um, when do you hire a cardiologist? What's your course of attack to, so that you have the best possible outcome? 
Incredibly good question with no great answer. So the question is, at what point, if you have a family history of any disease process, I mean, it can be GI disease, it can be cardiac disease, at what point do you go out and search out an expert and say, I need you to be involved in my care? We are always happy to see new patients. <laughs> um, that being said, uh, there are things that you know you should do and there are things you know you shouldn't do. And if you need a heart doctor to tell you those things and that will make you do it, that is a good thing to do. If you have symptoms, those things need to be evaluated. Cholesterol panels, as I said, have been proven time and time again in terms of primary prevention if you have a family history of coronary disease. It is, you know, it is less controversial in that situation. I, I think that routine stress testing in people who have no symptoms and who are active, you know, if you say I run the Grand Canyon, you know, up and down and I have no symptoms, the likelihood that I'm going to offer you something that will benefit you seems <coughs> small, okay? How small? The answer is what incremental benefit is enough? Well, I, think the, I think the other thing is perspective too, you know, people who work, you know, I think the one thing that you can't quantify is worry and we are we benefit from worry, not that we want to benefit from worry, but you know, I think people's concerns are a lot of times what motivates the reason for somebody coming to the doctor, the reason they want to get an x-ray, the reason they want to get a colonoscopy or check the heart. And I, I think it's always hard to quantify how important that is, because when you do the test and it's all fine, you know what, a person can go on for years and feel great and never worry about all the funny symptoms they experience and they're just, they disappear into the background. And I think for that reason, a lot of what we do when we find nothing is of tremendous value for people. Fortunately. Let me, let me ask that question to Doug just quickly. When do you send somebody? Well, I do treadmills in the office, and I do those for screening. If I see a change in a treadmill, I'll certainly send them to a cardiologist. Also, I think persons at particularly high risk, and I'm concerned about an event taking place despite efforts of prevention. But I'm a big believer in you know, the med you know, medical uh, or cl near medical equivalency of interventional approach. And so uh, I, you know, I have to see something that is particularly concerning as far as a symptom or some other risk profile that would make me think they need to see the cardiologist. Of course, often it's, what cardiologist do you recommend? That'll be the thing that prom uh, promotes getting to see a cardiologist <laughs> right away. Here, one more, one more question, then we're gonna quit. On this whole uh, theme of screening, periodically, I think we've all gotten something in the mail, come and have a whole body scan. It almost seems like a road show. This place or that place or some other place. I've always been skeptical of that. Is, does it have any proven benefit or is it just another make you feel good about yourself? Uh, it, it's, it's a fantastic question because there, there is a big industry in screening for health. The tests that really, the screening tests that have really been shown to save lives is mammography, colonoscopy, and there is some data that if you're at high risk for developing lung cancer, a CT scan of your lungs may provide some benefit. And I say that very gingerly. It's data from New York, the LCAP study. And we're starting to perhaps see the benefit of early detection leading to early cure. In general, you're going to find that screening studies are, uh, for an average a person of average risk for getting disease, they're not worth the money and we might find something that will turn out to be nothing. However, there are certain screening tests, I don't want people to leave the room thinking that we should never get screened. There are certain screening tests that are critical for good health. Very good, I, I wanna end it there and if there are any other questions you can come up. I wanna thank the panel, uh, John Mellon, Ron Korn, that kind of thing. Excellent, thank you. Thank you all very much for coming. Thanks for the great questions.